Lord, let this Sunday not be like any other Sunday. Let it be a day that you make us hear your voice. Let it be a day that we can experience your presence coming into this place as we praise your name. Because we need you, Lord. We need your presence. We need you. Not your hands, not your blessings. We need you, Lord. Oh, we need you to show us the way in this confusing time, Lord. We need you to be our guidance. We need you to be in our every days, Lord. I believe that you are the truth. I believe that you are the life. You are the way. You deserve all the glory and all the praise. I lift up my voice in praise and in thanksgiving, O oh God. For you are high, you are holy, you are the most high God. I bless your holy name. I will sing a new song, a new song, a new song of praise unto my God. Worthy, worthy, holy. Blessed Lord, you are mighty God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship. You are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, touching every heart, you are the way. Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, you're my God, that is who you are, that is who you are, yes. that is who you are, that is who you are. You haven't changed. You are the same. We change, but you never change. We doubt, you never doubt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are the rock I could stand on. You never stop working. Even when we stop listening or stop following, you never stop. Making a way where there is no way. Making wilderness to flourish rivers in the desert because that's who you are thank you thank you for several months God has been speaking in one way or another about taking his people not only here but wherever they are to a river to cross to a place they haven't been. Like the children of Israel crossing the Jordan to a land of promise. There's so many promises that we have not 
entered into, have not seen fulfilled, and they're there on the other side of a river that we must pass. But like it was in those times of Israel crossing with Joshua, the river overflowed its banks too deep to cross, too wide to cross. Impossible unless God did another miracle and helped them to cross. As I've mentioned before, many times in life we must cross a river to get to another place, a higher place of praise as a song we sang last week. Rivers have always marked a border, border from one county, from a city, from a state. They've always marked a boundary from the past to the future. But when we cross a river, the rivers find the lowest place to flow. And so you don't find rivers any place except valleys, the lowest place, not in the mountain, but in the valleys. So to cross it, we must go down many times. To get to the other side, we must go down into a shadowy or even dark valley to be able to cross to the promise, cross to where he wants us to be, a place of safety, a place of covering, a place where he is awaiting us. We all know the story of the prodigal son. He was so obedient until he wasn't. He was so faithful until he wasn't. He was always there for whatever the father asked of him until he wasn't. Who knows? Perhaps the father sent him to do a chore. He thought it was too much this time what he asked him. Maybe his brother was gone, or maybe a donkey or two were sick. And he said, I need you to plow the field, it's time. Or maybe, go seed this, or go harvest this. Alone, yes, your brother can't help you. Who knows what happened and something cracked inside. A seed of rebellion that lay deep within suddenly sprouted a drop, a little drop that caused his glass to overflow, a single straw that broke the proverbial back of the camel, or like many times, not just another storm in life that we've been through so many, but a perfect storm. One that we've, where all the circumstances seem against and the perfect storm happens. Or perhaps the voice of the tempter, the voice of that serpent in the tree, the discourager, the liar. Or perhaps as Paul wrote in his letter to the Galatians, chapter four, verse nine, he says, do not grow weary while doing well. Don't grow weary, don't grow tired. He said, well, I've been doing this all the time and I don't see any change. You don't get weary of doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. When is that due season? It's never when we think. 
It's always longer than we think. But he says, in due. He doesn't say how many months or how many years. He just says, in due time. If you don't grow weary of being faithful, in due season you shall reap if you do not lose heart. So we don't know why. Suddenly, the prodigal son left the father's house. Why? What he was expecting, perhaps a part of his inheritance that he asked his father. His father said, not yet. You'll have to wait for the due season, the right season. And he left. How sad, and yet, we all know how it ends. Perhaps you might be in a situation like that. You don't know how it ends, but we know how it ends. It always ends the same. It always ends with salvation. It always ends with a feast. It always ends with God winning, salvation overcoming. We know how it ends, even though we might be just entering into the storm. I can tell you how it ends. Restoration. The end was the return of the prodigal. A great feast of rejoicing. As a prodigal is not only restored, but given a robe of authority and power. A ring. And as the psalmist said in Psalm 30, 11, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. And yet, Jesus in that story does not tell us anything about the mother. He tells us about the father. But only a mother knows the pain when a son, a daughter, becomes a prodigal. He leaves the way that he has been taught and he gives his life over to sin. In fact, I believe inside of each one of us, there's a little of that prodigal son we're in the product, we're in the father's house until we're not. We're walking a road, we know. And then we're walking another road that we don't know. And we know the story, the time came. The prodigal son certainly suddenly came to himself. It's Eureka. Something happened. Why didn't he come? To himself before. Why? Did he have to wait for that moment where suddenly he looked around and said, what am I doing here? Who brought that thought into his mind? Who brought that emotion into his mind? Who brought the memory into his mind as he was eating the pig's food? And he said, suddenly, I remember the bread in my father's house. Oh, how good that was. Who put that thought there? So how long did that prodigal stay away? As long as it was needed for him to cross the river he was before he left his house into another place totally. He didn't go back to be the same. He wanted to say, oh look, Father, I'm, I'm sorry, I've sinned. Just, just let me become not even a son. Just let me become a servant. <clears throat> and the father said, no. You're back. You've crossed the river. You're not going down. Once you cross the river, you go up again. Go up the bank again. And go up the mountain to the next mountain. Why wait until we find ourselves with 
waters up to our neck until we finally surrender, come to our senses, return to the Father's house, to the safety of being under the wings of our Father's presence where our true home is. That story has touched millions upon millions of people, given them hope of salvation. And because of that story, a story that many times has been repeated in one area or another in our lives, Jesus said in John 17, 12, he said, those that you gave me, none of them have I lost. Well, what a precious, precious assurance. No matter where we might find ourselves, how far away, he says, I, I won't lose them. You might be lost, but I haven't lost them. I know where they are. All the people of Israel are descendants from a particle son called Jacob. When he ran away from home, went to sleep, God came and reminded him who he was. It was a long journey, many decades. But from the very beginning, he said, I am your father, the father of Abraham, of Isaac, and I'm yours too. And when your journey running away from home is over, Things are going to change. I'll be your God. But it wasn't until the waters got to his neck. Water so deep, trouble so deep. Poor Jacob was willing to give away everything he has worked for during the 20 years under Laban. All the sheep he has made, all his family sent them all to Isa just, just to be able to go back to God's calling. And without any way out, he found out that his brother was still coming after him. And all those things he had given up was not enough. Without any way, he then turned to God seeking help, and he struggled to turn his life around. Yes, like Jacob, running away, he came to a river, a river called Jabbok. He wanted to leave that river. He wanted to be blessed. But there was a man there. And he began to struggle. See, God wanted Jacob that came into the river as Jacob to cross to the other side, no longer as Jacob, but another man called Israel. So he went into the river Jacob. He went out of that river, not longer, not any longer strong with his own strength, but limping and blessed by the Father. There is a time, and many times, that we will come in our walk to a place where the only way to cross is go down to a river to be able to get up to the other side, to get to the other side. Because if not, our journey ends right here, a dead end that we circle and circle and circle and circle, but to go forward. There's only one way to cross 
the river. A perfect example of this is Saul. Yes, the one that persecuted the Christians. He was up on the top of a mountain of blessing, of knowledge, a high place of honor, being a part of the prestigious Sanhedrin council that were considered the leaders and rulers of the temple. Their word was holy. He was up there, the top. But he needed to cross a river, to get to a new mountain, where his calling for which he was born would be fulfilled in a higher place, that not only he would affect the people that were alive at that time in Jerusalem and the temple, but a mountain from which he would shout to centuries and millennia in the future. But he had to cross. He had to be made blind. There isn't a darker place than that. Yes, many times we go into a dark place, but we can always see a little bit. But hey, he walked into a river that was totally black. Darkness surrounded him. He couldn't see. And yet, he was made blind. So that he could go into that dark river, that dark valley, as Saul, and come out as Paul. As Ezekiel's river, in Ezekiel 44, that we've talked many times in these past months. You're taken into it, and of course, the first place he was taken was to the ankles, could handle that. Then he was taken deeper to the knees and then the loins, and then when you realize things are getting harder, not easier, darker, we realize that we are being taken. Yes, being taken, being taken to waters. Ezekiel said, I was up to my neck. I couldn't feel the bottom. It was beneath me like a bottomless pit. And here I am trying to stay afloat. Did he go there? No, he was taken there. He was taken from the place that he was to a new place. Waters too deep to control or even to be able to run away. Hmm. Elijah, he had to cross a river and he reached the deepest part of the river when one day a messenger came and said, we find it in 1 Kings 18, 22. He heard that the queen, Jezebel, had killed all the prophets there was in Israel. That was a shock. And he was the last prophet alive. Of course he didn't know. There was another story he would find out later that there was a man, Badiah, that worked in the palace that saved 100 prophets and they were in a cave and he fed them but Elijah didn't know that. All he knew is he was alone. Not only that, but he said, 1 Kings 18, 22, then said Elijah to the people, 
I, even I only am left the prophet of the Lord. But the prophets of Babel, there are 450, and I'm just one. And then, 1 Kings 19, 2, then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more, more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them, of those 400 I killed tomorrow by this time. 24 hours, the powerful queen said, you will be killed. Wow. And when he saw that, verse 3, he arose and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, he left his servant there. Strange. Why would he leave his servant there? He needed his servant. The servant could scout. He could tell him, hey, look, the army is a mile away. Go hide here. Go there. Why did he leave his servant? The prophet never went without a servant, which was also a scribe. He left his servant there, and then he took a road that went to no city. He took a road where there was no road and walked straight. Verse 4, for a 24-hour, a day's journey into the desert, the wilderness. And he came and sat down under a juniper tree, which, which means juniper tree means broom tree because it looked like a broom. And he came down and requested himself. Verse 4. You're in verse 5 there. Go back one verse. He went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under the broom tree and he prayed that he might die and said, it's enough. Now, Lord, take my life. Tell me if that wasn't a dark place, a very dark place. He had gotten to the bottom of the dark valley. When he got there to that juniper tree, the 24 hours were past, and he could only imagine the torture that he would be subjected to. And he said, God, enough. I'm tired. I'm tired of fighting against evil. I'm tired. Enough, that's it, that's it, that's it. I can't go anymore. I know you call me. I know that you want to use me, but that's it. That's it. It's too much, too much. He requested that he might die he said, oh, Lord, you take away my life. It's so simple for you. You just touch my heart. That's it. That's it. No more suffering. No more torture of Jezebel in the prisons of the castle. Just take me. I'm no better than my father's. Yes, there seemed no way out from those waters up to his neck. He tried to flee from life's problems. And he's been running from Jezebel ever since he killed the prophets of Baal. Yes. 
He had been running and hiding here and hiding there. But now he began to sink into a hole of depression. Do you know now the biggest sickness in this country and many other countries is depression. Every time you go to, to a doctor's office, they ask you, the nurse asks you, do you feel so suicidal? I said, no, I'm a pastor. I know you're a pastor, but I still have to ask you. Do you feel depressed? Well, of course not. Do you have dark thoughts? No. Do you feel like suicide? No, why are you asking me all these questions? I'm all right, hi. They said, no, we have to. You can't imagine. It's the biggest sickness there is, depression. And Elijah sank into the deepest depression. There seemed no way out. The 24 hours were gone. No place to go. He was finally in a dead end where there was no road from then on. It all stopped at the border of river. Couldn't go back, couldn't go left, couldn't go right. The only way forward was to cross the river. And yes, when you get to that place where the water's up to your neck, you can stay afloat. You can try it back, you can try in the front, you can move your arms, but sooner or later, you're gonna get tired. Sooner or later. See, a river's not, not an ocean. An ocean has a lot of salt. It's a lot easier to float a little bit. But sooner or later, your strength will slowly go away and you'll find there's no way out. of the middle of that river unless someone takes you out. No road. In life, many times, people feel it's like a roundabout. You just keep going in circles and circles and circles, and repeating the same cycle, wash, rinse, repeat. Same thing, get up, go to work, come back. And people find themselves in this squirrel cage or hamster's cage going around and around, going nowhere with no exit, no way out. For you see, like I said, Elijah heard that all the prophets have been killed. Now they were after him. So after saying, I want to die, God Please take me. He went to sleep. Hoping he'd never wake up on this side of the world. Because he asked God, please take me. So he went to sleep and said, I'll wake up. And I'll be in the bosom of Abraham. That was the heaven of that time. Because heaven hadn't been opened yet. He went to sleep hoping that his problems would be over. He had given up, no way out. The water's too deep, his strength gone, his faith gone, his hope drained. And as he slept, he had a dream. A dream that he heard a voice. You know, when, when you're sleeping and, and uh, your husband or your mother comes and says, wake up, son. And you're sort of incorporated into your dream. You think your son so it incorporate. Come on, hello, it's time to get up, time to get to school. <sighs> time to get to school. 
And this is cool. Uh, so he heard a voice. And then he heard like it felt like it was a tap on his shoulder. And as he opened his sleepy eyes, he thought he was dead already because he saw an angel. And it was touching him. And here, yes, we have 1 Kings 19, verse 5. And as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. He looked around. There was a broom tree. There was the hot wind of the desert. Oh no, I'm not dead. And he looked, for next verse, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a jar of water at his head while he slept in the darkness. God was working. Yes, he is working. Never stops, never stops working. Never stops, never stops working. And what was he doing? He became God the chef. Not bringing him some bed, some bread. He was making a cake. Wow, a cake. He was making a cake while he slept. God had been working in all his blackness of his dream and dreaming it was all over and, and this and that and finally I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. There's no more, nobody's gonna persecute me. My... While he slept in his darkness, reaching his darkest place, God was gathering some seeds to make some flour to make a cake. And he was gathering water. Now remember, Elijah was sleeping under that tree a day's journey into the wilderness. You have to walk a day in order to go get some flour or to find some water because he didn't go and sit under a juniper tree that was by a river or even a spring because he was going there to die. So he wasn't looking for any water or any food. But he never stops, never stops working. So where did the flower come from and the water? Well, first, his messenger, his angel, or the angel of the Lord. It might have been the angel of the Lord, which was Jesus in the Old Testament, gathering the firewood while Elijah, Elijah was out in a deep sleep, then starting a fire. Eduardo's the expert here of barbecues, so make sure I'm saying this correct. Gather the wind. Well, the other professional here in that is, is David, right over there, that was leading the, leading the singing. They gather the wood, start a fire, and wait and wait and wait until that fire burns up the wood and only the coal is left. And meanwhile, oblivious to what God was working, Elisha, Elijah was sleeping. The wood became hot coals. Then he gathered his favorite seeds. They described it in the desert as the cor it was similar to a coriander seed. 
And they said, what's that? Which means manna. So that's his favorite seed. So he gathered the manna. He made the flour. He added some water. He kneaded the flour and the water into something he could cook. A cake. Wow. Maybe it was a birthday cake. Celebration cake. I don't know what cake it was, but I know that he placed that cake, it says, on the red embers. And when everything was ready, and the smell of pancakes and coffee came into the room of the sleeping man, and he woke up, and he looked, and an angel, a cook, water in the desert, and a cake on the coals. Yes, it was all ready when Elijah awakened. It's so important that when or if we ever get so downtrod or discouraged or depressed, dis depressed that those dark thoughts that we pay so much attention to because you will hear, even as you sleep, even as you're in that dark place, you will hear the whisper of God. You will feel like the song that says, the angel wings fluttering. For the land is holy ground. I can feel the wings of angels saying, God is here working in our midst. Wake up. The table is awaiting. The psalmist said in Psalm 23, David, in verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of Jezebel, in the presence of my enemies, you prepare a table. So wake up, wipe off the cobwebs. It's time to eat and to drink. And you will hear voices in that dark place. Those are the messengers. It might be in a sermon, it might be a verse in the Bible. It might be a word or something that in a conversation came out or a dream or something you see in a video or a thought that comes from the blue into your brain or a beautiful bird, colorful bird it comes as you're sitting on the porch and stops right on the rail and you look it's not scared it doesn't fly away you say that's strange maybe it's a message from God yes because it's written in Hebrews 1 1 God who in sundry times and diverse manners has spoken to us in the past and to our fathers. Yes, in the weirdest of ways, you will hear God speak to you as you're going through that dark place. And you'll hear, and it'll like spark something inside and, and maybe it'll die away. But then something else that'll say, it's not over, it's not over. I've got food prepared for you. Angel food, full of faith protein, full of antidepressants, full of hope that will strengthen you. 
Yes, for a while there might be peace and you sleep peacefully thinking. You can forget about life. You can forget about your problems. You can forget the haunting of fearful thoughts. You can't run away though. You can't. You can't. They won't disappear. But the real message of that angel was not to come here, eat and then die. Your last meal. No, 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 no. The message of the angel was eat. You need to be strengthened. And it screamed, it's not over. Elijah. And we read that after he ate the cake and the water, he got sleepy again. And he dozed back to sleep. And then again, 1 Kings 19, 7, and the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you too powerful for you so he woke again from his deep sleep you know when, when you get your tummy full of wonderful food you said I want to take a nap well he did but it wasn't over again he says, it's not over. Yes, it's over. Jezebel is coming. I'm going to die. You're not going to die. Eat some more. I'm not hungry. Eat some more. You need to eat. Because the journey is too powerful for you. You can't make this journey on your own. You need to eat this food angel food, eat manna, water. Where on earth could the angel of the Lord find water? If the angel of the Lord that in the Old Testament was Jesus, did he not say, if you're thirsty, come to me. I will give you living waters. So there was living waters in the desert. Living waters that when you drink, it produces more water inside. Water of life. This will be like inside a bubbling river of life that you're not thirsty anymore. Because it's a long journey and you're weak. So drink this water and eat this meat. And that journey was not, the, the end of this journey was the mountain of Horeb. But his journey that he needed to make was not just a, a pilgrimage to Horeb. Because from where he was, Mount Horeb was only about 200 miles away, which could have been reached by walking between six and seven days. He could have made it. But the next verse, verse 8, 1 Kings 19, 8, it says, and he arose, and he ate, and he drank, and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of the Lord. So quite a journey he meant. It's interesting that just like Israel was 40 years wandering the desert, he was going around the desert for 40 days, something that only lasted one week. He went here, then there, then up, then down. 
40 days, 40 days, one day's journey to get to the Jupiter tree, 40 days of journey to get to the place where God was awaiting for him. He would wandered in the desert. Horeb in Hebrew means desert or a mountain of the dried up ground. And like Saul, his encounter with the Lord after he fell from the horse and he was made blind and then he was healed, he also went into the desert as Saul and came out as Paul. Yes, when you come out of this, you'll come out different. You'll come out on the other side that God has prepared for you. And when he reached the mountain of Horeb, there were many caves. Elijah waited until God came and said, okay, I got a job for you. I got a job that's gonna affect the country of Israel, the land of Israel, for many, many, many decades. And then he found out what the calling of what God had for him was not only that it wasn't done, but he was to raise up another prophet like him. And then he found out there was 400 that had been hidden. Then he had to go and anoint a man that was walking down the trail and said, you will be the king of Israel. And we all know what happened to Jezebel. God take care of, don't worry. Anyone that touches God's beloved is going to get a licking. Believe it. They don't get away with it. They can't just go willy-willy. No, Jezebel was eaten up by wild dogs when she fell or was thrown probably from a window up in the castle. No, she didn't end well. And so he got to the mountain of Horeb. Interesting. Horeb is the mountain that Moses, when he was, had to flee from Egypt, is when he took his flock, or Jethro's, his father-in-law's flock, to the backside, it says, of the desert in Exodus 3.1, and it says he came to the mountain of the Lord. That's what it was called, the mountain of the Lord. So young Moses, banished from Egypt, was living a regular, round, go-around life, repeating itself day after day, getting up, having some breakfast, going out, taking care of the sheep of his father-in-law, wandering in life, till one day, as he was approaching the mountain of the Lord, a bush burned in the distance, and the rest is history. Mount Horeb is also a place that is known for God revealing himself in the place where Moses received the Ten Commandments and the laws and the rules and the instructions. And Deuteronomy tells us that Horeb was another place, special place, because that is when God made a covenant. So I end asking if you are like Elijah, going to sleep under a juniper tree, hoping that it might all end. The question is, how long is the journey from the bank on one side to the bank of another side? How long is it before the descent that 
perhaps you are going through now becomes an ascent of the next mountain. How long was the journey from the shores of the ford of Jabbok? Where, how long did it take for Jacob to become Israel? The time of the descent of the bank, the width of the river or how long it will last that we must cross before going up to the promised land is determined not by you, is determined by God. In fact, it is written, each of us has a book of life that was written when a name was given us before the foundation of the world, that each one that belonged to him have. And everything there, from every sickness, every temptation, every problem, has been written. And not only has it been written what will happen and what must happen in our lives, but the way out also, the time, the date, and the hour. So how long will the crossing of the river, it might be walking on the water like Peter, hey. And the other guy is waiting down, he says, hey, he crossed in 10 minutes, it's over. Next day it went to sleep, next day the problem's gone. Another one's wading through. How long will it be? I don't know. But I do know our life is in his hands. And a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without him seeing it and knowing it. So the length of the time is determined by God. But you will awake. You will eat of the angel's food, of the bread of heaven, of the cake of God, and drink of the waters of life. For as it is written, and Jesus answered the tempter, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And you will hear the words of God speaking to you saying, it is over. The battle is over. So cherish those words that he speaks to you. It will give you strength for the journey you have awaiting from the past to the future of what God has for you, prepared for you. So wake up, Elijah, eat. Be strengthened, for you need strength for the journey. Your journey is not over. Father, help us to believe. Help us to trust. Help us to lay hold upon your promises as never before. Because your word fails not. For you are not man that you should lie. But what you've promised you will do. So I ask that in these times when your church and your people are walking down the banks to be crossed to the place you want your church to be. For this time of history, strengthen us, strengthen me. Give me to eat of the food, the bread of heaven. And feed me till I want no more. Till I'm strong enough to overcome 
the tempter's voice. Because the way for a little while will be difficult. But in the power of your love, we will overcome every valley. And we will rise up as eagles to the next mountain. And look back and say, I thought I'd never, I'd never leave that valley. And here I am. Rising up as eagles. Not because of our wings, but because we're being taken on the wings of our Savior. And as we wait, as we wait, as Elijah in the cave, as we wait for your deliverance, we will be strengthened. And you will take us from this place we could never leave on our own. And we will rise up to the place of the eagles. Your spirit that leads us onward, upward. into our calling. Not by our faithfulness or our love, but by the power of your love, your strength, your hope, your faith. not my love because my love is fickle my love changes weakens gets angry but if you hold me close if you hold me close if you hold me if you place me upon the rock I will be able to stand in the deep waters because my strength, I know, might last a day, might last a week, but when the waters are waters so deep that I can't feel the bottom under my feet. If you place me upon the rock, I'll be able to stand in the deepest of rivers. Place the rock under our feet that we might not sink into despair Help us, help your people. They're in this place. In different places of the world. Sustain them. Awaken those that have given up. That they might rise up by the power of your love 
So you might be still on the bank and saying, thank God, I'm not in that dark place. But know that the whole world will be going into a valley, that it will affect the church. But there's nothing to fear. You might not see him, but he's standing right there by you. You're not alone. Even if you might think you have to pass through the valley of shadows, even of death itself, you need not fear. Because he is with you. His rod, his staff will comfort you. So whether you're on the top of the mountain or at the bottom of the valley in the deep rivers, or if you're coming out on the other side and starting to climb, like our brother said, it's not about you. It's about he that called you and is with you and will never leave you. For you are not alone, nor will you ever be alone. Because he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone that believeth should not perish but have everlasting life. And you'll make it through. Why? Because as Jesus prayed for Peter, not that he wouldn't have to go through the valley. But when you come back, there's never a valley without a way back. He won't take you to that place where there's no way out. Because he will be glorified. He will be glorified. Yes. He will be glorified and he will wipe the tears off your cheeks and change your mourning. You thought you'd never dance again? Think again. You will. <laughs> yes, by the power of his light. Not only that, but these clothes you've worn up to here may be very nice, may be beautiful, may be anointed. There'll be new clothes given, beautiful clothes. You must say, I don't deserve this. You'll never deserve anything. But, but, but I was in the depth of the valley and I doubted doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is your back. Let's celebrate. Here, put on this new robe. No, no. That's not, for, that's not me. Wow. Put on this robe. Give me your hand. I got a ring for you. Wow. The story of redemption of the God that loved us, gave his son for us, and his spirit to walk with us every day of our life, through every valley and even up every mountain. It is not over. Hold me close. Let your love surround me. Bring me near. Draw me to your side. And as I wait 
I'll rise up like the eagle and I will again soar with you. Your spirit will again lead me on in the power of his love by the power of his love